Welcome, everybody. I'm Eric Potashnik, Director of the Master of Public Affairs Program here at the Watson Institute. And it is a real uh, privilege and honor for me to introduce today's speaker, John Sturman, who's the Jay Forrester Professor of Management at MIT Sloan School. Uh, Professor Sturman is, I think it is fair to say, the world's leader, the most distinguished expert in the field of systems dynamics. Some of you have had exposure to this through our program here at Brown. Others of you may have heard of it vaguely, but I think you'll get a sense today of its powerful insights into issues ranging from climate that you'll be talking about today to environment to organizational change. Uh, Professor Sturman has uh, lectured broadly around the world to corporate groups, to policymakers, bringing his very powerful and unique perspective to understanding why some of the problems that we uh, are trying to solve often persist and how we can find more effective leverage points for making sustainable progress. Uh, he's also the author of um, a textbook that we're using this semester uh, in, our M uh, in our MPA core class on systems dynamics. and. Uh, as somebody who I've, I'm a co-author in a small little policy analysis textbook, I just have to marvel at the book. It is so lucid and well organized and really I think does a great job of introducing a, a complicated subject in a way that's very accessible. And that's the kind of educational contribution that I think we don't often recognize enough how important that is. So it's a real pleasure to have John here today and welcome to the Watson Institute. Great. Thank you, Eric. And, and thank you all for having me. Um, so the introduction was a little extravagant, so let me, let me ratchet down your expectations. Every semester I run midterm feedback so the students can tell me how I can do better. And one semester a student wrote on the forum that he thought I was a model professor. And I thought this was pretty terrific for a few minutes until I realized that a model is a small imitation of the real thing. So uh, let me start out with a question for all of you. And I would encourage you to ask questions as we go along, not just try to wait for the end. So. Uh, First of all, how many of you are in Eric's class right now that I'm going to be? OK, great. So you get a little preview, uh, a little advantage for tonight. So welcome. Uh, and now, uh, let's take the temperature of the room with respect to the issue of climate change. So how many of you believe that the climate is changing? You have to vote, right? You can't, you can't abstain. Uh, not changing. OK. How many believe that the climate change we're experiencing is primarily the result of human activity and not primarily the result of human activity. Yeah, so I was a little bit afraid of this, right? Preaching to the choir. But, uh, you know, the choir needs support. There's a reason you go if you go uh, on Sundays or whenever you choose to worship, uh, and that's because the choir needs support. Uh, so we aren't going to sing any hymns today, although one of the problems with the sustainability movement is we just don't have any good music, any good songs, the way we did back in the civil rights protest and Vietnam protest era. And yeah, I am old enough to remember that. So let me start out with um, the way most climate change talks start. Uh, and I think this is an unusually difficult problem, maybe the most difficult problem humanity has ever had to address. It's a perfect storm for confusion and delay. And one reason is the climate is, of course, a complex dynamical system. It's noisy. It's really uh, hard to understand what's going on. You have to understand the carbon cycle. There's all these complex graphics and so forth. You can't run experiments. And there's very, very long time delays in the system. It's also a problem subject to the tragedy of the commons. I benefit personally when I burn carbon because I get to fly around the world and do whatever I do, as, as do all of you. And all the costs are going to be deferred into the future and borne by other people. And it's a story with tremendous inequity. So this shows the carbon emissions per capita of all the nations in the world where they're sized to that level of emissions. And you can see China, the world largest emitter, the US number two, the EU as a group, India, and Africa hardly exists at all. And yet they are going to suffer the most. The poor countries, the least developed countries, they're going to suffer the most from climate change, although it's no picnic for us either. Uh, and yet they've contributed so far the least to the problem. And furthermore, in order to understand this using any of the scientific evidence, you have to be able to understand what for most people are highly unfamiliar scientific concepts, terminology and units of measure, things like parts per million and parts per billion of concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions per year, watts per square meter of radiative forcing, and if you're American, degrees Celsius. 
So uh, this is really tough for people. What makes it even more difficult is that public opinion on this issue is strongly conditioned by ideology, and there's very powerful, uh, well-funded interests that aggressively work to discredit the science and the evidence and confuse you. Uh, and this brings up strong emotions, typical emotions uh, that I experience and that the audience in any events that I run experience, and in general on this issue, include fear, anger, denial, helplessness, and despair. And somebody coming in, I think the AV tech, when we were setting up, you said, so is this talk going to really depress me? So I hope not. On the other hand, we can't go into denial and pretend everything's going to be just fine. Uh, here's a couple little illustrations of the political uh, context here. Uh, just spraying some Prius repellent. And this infamous billboard that was put up by the Heartland uh, Institute uh, features the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, saying he still believes in global warming, do you? So uh, of course, what happens when people give talks on climate change is it's not surprising when everybody runs screaming from the room. So I'm going to try something a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to borrow from my friend and colleague, Tony Lazarowitz, who runs the climate change communication program at Yale. And he summarizes what's going on in climate change in 10 words. It's real. It's us. It's bad. Scientists agree. And there's hope. So let's talk about that real fast. So it's real. So this is where most climate science talks start to go off the rails, not because what they show isn't true, correct, but because people don't care. You know, here's the evidence. So this is global average surface temperature since 1880. It has risen more than one degree C, about 1.2 actually, above pre-industrial levels. To put that in context, at the Paris Agreement, all nations of the world, essentially all nations of the world, agreed to limit global temperature increases to less than 2 degrees C and striving for 1.5. And we're already more than halfway from that pre-industrial level to that 2 degree threshold. And this is caused by human activity. It's us. So this is carbon dioxide emissions from 1960 up till the most recent available data. You can see that although the developing nations of the world didn't contribute very much Historically, they are now, China the world's largest emitter, U.S. second, EU as a bloc is third, in India is fourth, the third largest individual nation, and all the rest of the world, which is mostly the developing world, uh, is, is an enormous bloc. And they're all basically growing. And in fact, total emissions were flat for three years, uh, but last year went up significantly while we know emissions need to fall in order to hit the Paris targets. The consequence of that growth in emissions, of course, is that carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere and is at levels today above 400 parts per million that are higher than at any time since there have been humans on this planet uh, and rising faster than any time in millions of years. So that's the way most climate change talks start, and people are now nodding off because it's boring. Uh, and uh, so let's do something a little different. Uh, Tony also points out, as is correct, that climate change is very bad, and not just in the future, but today. So the consequences of Superstorm Sandy, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, 6,300 people killed. No question that these storms were made significantly worse by climate change, warmer sea surface temperatures, et cetera. Just this past year, less than a year ago, the hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, Maria, that devastated our country, uh, the fires in California less than six months ago. This was just in March in Boston uh, when one of our nor'easters hit. And these are streets and sidewalks that are normally for walking and driving. And they are, well, there's white caps on them. Uh, and there's no doubt that these storms have been made worse by the high sea surface temperatures and the greater energy in the, in the environment. One of the curious impacts of climate change is, of course, that wet areas get wetter. Extreme weather gets worse wherever you are. Uh, wet, wet areas get wetter, but dry areas get drier. And drought and crop failure is one of the major threats, not just threat, currently happening today uh, as a result of anthropogenic climate change, no diving from the bridge. So uh, beyond that, we have the issue of the air pollution, the local air pollution that's generated by burning all those fossil fuels. 
So the World Health Organization tells us that 7 million deaths per year, which is an eighth of all mortality around the world, is caused by air pollution, and most of that is the consequence of burning fossil fuels, tailpipes, factories, etc. All these issues scientists agree. 97% of climate scientists uh, agree with the consensus that climate is changing and it's primarily caused by human activity and that it poses serious risks to our prosperity, our health and welfare, and even our lives. But that's not the problem. The, there's no scientific debate about this anymore, no credible doubt about these things, uh, but the public is not there yet. And a major part of the reason is the vested interests and uh, others who are working very diligently and so far rather successfully to discredit the science, to sow doubt, uh, and have succeeded in creating a huge partisan divide in this country over this issue. So you can see uh, some of the more recent polling data shows there is a, an uptick in uh, belief that the climate is changing and, and that it's largely caused by humans. Uh, but a persistent, enormous partisan gap there between Democrats and Republicans. And you can parse this many ways, uh, lots of detail here showing, showing this. Um, so what does the scientific community say we should do about this? Well, unfortunately, still today, the most popular approach is the information deficit approach. So what is the information deficit model? It basically says, you don't understand it if you don't agree with the scientific consensus, so let me tell you the facts. Uh, and here's a typical quotation from a paper uh, where, you know, a well-intentioned scientist says, look, we should use evidence to make decisions at every level of society. And if people don't know the evidence, which sadly often turns out to be the case, it is surely our role as science communicators to fill that gap. Or as uh, the late former uh, U.S. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Moynihan is famously credited with saying, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. This is hard to argue with. We want decisions to be based on evidence. We want science to be brought to bear, especially those of us in the academy. And I like this approach, except that there's one problem. Research shows that showing people research doesn't work. And here's what happens, right? Here's a group of people attending a typical climate science briefing. It's just so deadly dull. So in my group and in our partners, with our partners at Climate Interactive, which is a nonprofit my colleagues and former students have created to move this work forward, we have taken a different approach. Uh, and our theory of change is pretty straightforward. Our theory of change is imagine that a perfect agreement came out of the Paris climate talks. We were there with our models. I'll show you that they've been used, et cetera. Lots of people contributed to the success in Paris. It is the best climate agreement we've ever had, and yet it is still woefully inadequate. But imagine that a perfect agreement had come out of Paris because every head of state listened to their scientists, took on board the evidence, and said, OK, we have to, we have to be more, more aggressive. What would have happened when that perfect agreement came back for ratification and implementation to Brussels, London, Jakarta, Brasilia, Mexico City, and Washington, D.C.? What would have happened? That's a real question for you. So being a professor in a school of management, I have the privilege or right to cold call people. So what would have happened? Perfect agreement which would specify much deeper emissions than Paris did. Now it comes back for ratification and implementation. What happens? So what would have happened in Washington, D.C.? Right. It would be DOA because it couldn't get through the Congress. What do you think would happen in all the other capitals of the world? Same thing. Dead on arrival. We barely got the Paris Agreement ratified, uh, and now many nations are falling short or pulling back. So why is that? And the answer is there's not enough grassroots support among citizens and voters for the elected representatives or even those who are not in democracies uh, to take on board the will of the people and take appropriate action. So that's our theory of change, that yes, of course, we have to get the policymakers on board. We're not going to do that by showing them research because 
they're just going to fall asleep. Uh, but that's not sufficient. We have to build broad base of public support for folks to uh, demand the kind of change that we need. Uh, so how do we do this, right? So in most settings where you can't learn because somebody tells you, you learn from experience or you learn by running experiments. That's not possible for the climate. So we do what airlines do to train pilots, what power plants do to train operators, what the military does to train its people. We have to run simulations. So we've developed a uh, interactive simulation model. We call it C-ROADS, Rapid Over Climate Rapid Overview and Decision Support System. It's freely available. It's fully documented. Every equation, every assumption is out there in the public domain for you to use, try, critique, build upon, rip apart. Um, and I'm actually going to do a little demo with you in, in just a second. So, um, so here's what we did. We've created a model that behaves the same way that the large three-dimensional supercomputer-based climate models do, but it runs instantly on a laptop, whereas those large models that IPCC uses, for example, take weeks or even longer to run a single scenario. So that is essential for the progress of climate science, and we use all those models, but in plain language, it's absolutely useless in the policy domain. So for example, when the US and China were negotiating what became their bilateral agreement in 2014, uh, each side would put forward proposals. And as it, the negotiations got intense, on a daily cycle. And you've got to be able, if you're President Obama's team in the White House, uh, you've got to be able to evaluate the Chinese latest proposal that same day. And maybe that same news cycle if it gets leaked inadvertently or deliberately into the media. So you can't wait for those models. So our model behaves the same way as the large models. It's been peer-reviewed. And here's how it's been used. Uh, since we first developed it in around 2008, it's been used by all kinds of policymakers around the world, including the ones you see here, the US until the election, China, Brazil, France, others, the Secretary General's office. So I briefed uh, Ban Ki-moon when he was still the SG and his climate folks. Uh, down at, in New York. It's been used by UNEP and others. And, you know, including, and these are all people who have personally used the model. So former Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, uh, former head of the UNFCCC, Christiana Figueres, uh, Jonathan Pershing and Todd Stern, who were the U.S. Special Envoys for Climate Change, one after the other. Uh, Professor Hunjikun from uh, China, who is one of the Chinese government's main climate advisors. And, of course, former Secretary of State Kerry, uh, and when I say they've all personally used the model, I mean they've actually personally used the model. So, for example, uh, John Kerry said, I, I have to tell you, it works. It's important, and it's getting broad dissemination. And I used it. And that means he actually took the mouse and ran his own simulations. That was, that's what we're looking for. Showing people research doesn't work, but if they take it over and they're in charge of their learning, there's at least the possibility that people can learn the lessons for themselves. Uh, the model was one, not the only, but one of the tools used by the U.S. government uh, to negotiate that bilateral between China and the U.S. in 2014. Uh, John Holdren had it on his computer, and you can read, I'm not going to read this, you can read what he said about it. The uh, president was briefed on it and so forth. So the model was, is used, although not any longer in the U.S. since the change in administration. Uh, Although I will say that I'm willing to work with anyone who's serious. So if uh, new Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo, uh, wants to get serious about this and fill the seat for the Special Envoy on Climate Change, uh, we're, we'd be happy to work with them. Anybody who's serious, it's not a partisan issue. Uh, and it's also been used, getting back to the issue of how do you build public support with uh, faith leaders and other important leaders in civil society around the world. So uh, here I am presenting uh, C. Rhodes to the Dalai Lama. Um, he loves to laugh. This was before he did it. And then afterwards, he said, uh, this is a serious matter, and I will join you shouting, shouting, not for selfish reasons, but for the well-being of all humanity. So uh, enough talk. Let's do it. So uh, this is the model. Now, this is the exact same simulation model that the policymakers use, 
but I've put, we've put a simpler interface on it for teaching purposes because time is very short. The full model lets you put in very detailed scenarios for 20 individual nations and regions of the world. Here we've got the world divided into just six regions, the United States, the European Union, all the other developed nations, so Canada, Australia, Russia, Japan, etc., China, India, and all the other developing nations of the world, which includes the poorest of the poor, along with the emerging economies like Mexico, Chile, Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa, etc. So, uh, same model, different interface, and to keep it simple, um, we're going to have you make a couple of quick decisions here. And uh, yeah, we're doing fine. So on this side, on the left, we have carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere from 2000 through 2100. It's historical data up through now, that little tiny growth bump in 2017. And then a business as usual scenario, and you can pick from a number, but this BAU scenario basically says if there's no action, if everybody just keeps going, no carbon prices or very few, no significant policy action to get us off of our addiction to oil and fossil fuels, as President George W. Bush famously termed it, uh, then emissions would rise until they're about 100 gigatons, billion tons of CO2 per year, and it's about 38 billion tons per CO, of CO2 per year today. Now, the model includes just slight geek out technical aside for those of you who are interested. This is just CO2. The model includes, and I can show you if you're interested, all the other greenhouse gases that are in the model, uh, methane, nitrous oxide, sulfur hexafluoride, the chlorofluorocarbons, many, many species of them, uh, black carbon, aerosols, etc. And if you count all of those, total greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 equivalents are about 48 billion tons per year and rising. Uh, and the consequence of all this is that by the year 2100, we're at 4.2 C. Now, I, I'm going to use C, but this is the United States. We can switch it over to Fahrenheit if, if, if you want. Uh, but, but I'll stick, whoops, sorry. I'm going to stick with C if that's okay with all of you. Uh, and the consequence of that, and by the way, we crossed the two degree threshold here uh, well before 2050. So, you know, one reaction to this that I sometimes get is, 2100? Are you kidding me? I don't even know what I'm doing after lunch. But so now I'm going to ask you all a question. So how many of you uh, have children now? I mean, if you're willing to answer, okay. How many of you think you might want to have children someday? It's not a binding commitment, and please, <laughs> Please don't get started until after lunch, right? So, uh, so how many? Can I see those hands? Okay, so a lot of the students are in that situation. I don't know, those of you who have children now, how old they are. But, you know, your students, uh, either undergrads, grad students, so maybe, just hypothetically, you might decide to have your first child in, I don't know, 2025. What is life expectancy at birth for elites like us? It's about 80 years. So your child, born in 2025, can expect to live until after the year 2100, unless we screw it up. And your grandchildren, well, well after that. And some of the students in the room who are younger, you're going to live through most of this century. So this is not theoretical at all. So figure out what you're going to do after lunch. <laughs> and then get busy on what really matters. So here's what we're going to do. Um, and I mean, I can show you the economic assumptions, et cetera. Ask me, and we can dig into that. But what we're going to do is we're going to put in your ideas for how emissions might evolve in the future, given what you understand or think these different countries and country groups might be willing to do. So let's start with the United States. So how would you like to be President Trump right now? So listen, no judgment, all right? All right. So uh, what, what would emissions do for the United States? And to keep it really simple, you just need to tell me, so U.S. emissions are growing, projected to grow. 
the economy is growing. Now, they grow less than the economy because there's technological innovation, independent of policy, there's, there's uh, energy efficiency being deployed, et cetera. But uh, in what year do you think um, U.S. emissions might stop growing, might peak under your administration, sir? So you got to give me something, right? right? Uh, Otherwise, we just keep your BAU trajectory. Right. Um, say 50 years. From now? Yeah. So, uh, so 2070? OK, great. So one of the beauties of the model is we can put in whatever you want. So here's 2068, uh, OK? Now, uh, the red band right here, that's US emissions. and the model just simulated that fast. And you can see that in 2068, U.S. emissions flattened out, and it didn't make any difference. Are you willing to actually have U.S. emissions fall, sir, starting when? As soon as possible. After 2068, though, unless you want to revise that. Um, I mean, your second term is going to end in 2024, right, so 2025. So, uh, so let's say um, let's say five years from now. Five years from, so 20, 2073? Uh, no, let's change the first one. Okay, to what? Ten, uh, make it uh, 2025 ish, 2027, yeah. 2028. That's 10 years. Okay, 2028. And you can see that took 0.1 degree C off of the expected warming. So, great. Now, how about a decline? So that's after your second term is over and you've written your memoir. So <laughs> let's see um, uh, another 10 years. So 2038, great. And now at what fractional rate? 1% per year, half a percent per year, one and a half? What kind of decline rate? So the economy is going to keep growing. You're going to be telling me give me a number here, you can, and you can say no, it just stays constant. The emissions would be falling at that rate while the economy grows. So what do you think is plausible here for the United well, States? I would ask you as, as a scientist what, what's reasonable. So here's the thing about our theory of change. That's a great question to ask. I'm not going to give you the answer. You should consult with your colleagues. If we had more time, we only have the remainder of the hour. Right. And you would do a little research, because now you want to know the answer to that question. If I told you the answer and showed you a PowerPoint slide, you're either sleeping or you're going like this. So just give me a number, and we'll, we can experiment. Let's you're not, say 2%. Uh, 2% 2 per year. Great. Certainly technically feasible. So now you can see US emissions uh, peak in 2028 and then they start to fall in 2038 at that 2% rate. And by the end of the century, we've done a pretty good job at cutting our emissions. Now, there's also policy decisions about forestry. You can cut deforestation. You can uh, plant new forests, afforestation, reforestation. Time is short, so we're going to leave those alone for right now. OK, so how about right here in the middle, doing Facebook or whatever? <laughs> you are the European Union. So Chancellor Merkel, what would you like to do? Clearly. You must think you can do better than Mr. Trump, right? So in what year would you like to uh, stop the growth of EU emissions? Great. In fact, you've already kind of done it. Uh, so 2018. That's as soon as possible. And the green band of the EU just fell. We've taken two-tenths of a degree off of the projected warming. Now, how about a decline from the EU? On the Western change. ones, yeah. Poland, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, etc. Not so much. They've got a lot of coal. They like it. In fact, the next UN climate summit is in Katowice, Poland, this November, in coal country. Actually, the last one uh, in Bonn was also in coal country. Dirty brown lignite coal. Uh, so, what would you like to do here? I feel that, um, and I don't. I'm not. A pla I don't know much about climate change. Understand. Because this is not an area that I've read much about. Give but, me your best shot. But the thing is, like, developed nations, industrialized nations like Germany and UK and US, 
you know, they have already had their, like, they have already used their coal, and they have already, like, made a lot of carbon emissions. And I feel that it's kind of unfair that developing nations are, like, Absolutely or Eastern right. Europeans, you are telling them to reduce it. Why don't they get a chance to, like, pollute the river and also build their... So you're going to take on board your historic responsibility for building your economy to prosperity, using fossil energy, and so you're going to take on that moral burden, which means you're going to want to cut your emissions. So in what year are you going to start a decline? Well, which perspective? Am I the developed nation you're, or am you're I... You're Angela Merkel, representing the EU. Well, I feel that because we have... Well, if I'm Angela Merkel, we've already come a long way, and now we can actually start investing in, in reducing carbon emissions. So I would do it now, ASAP. But I already feel we have done so much that... <laughs> You know, but just invest you will make a great politician. <laughs> so how about if I say, you're, you want to be aggressive, take on your historic, would it be okay if we said in the year 2020, you will begin a decline in your emissions, peak, peak right now, two years constant, then start to fall, is that okay? Great, so 2020, whoops, typo, 2020. Now, uh, at what rate? The U.S. said 2% per year, starting later than you. Do you think you can meet that? or beat it. Your economy is still going to grow. I feel that um, if I am Angela Merkel, that I would, my constituents would be like, easier to work with. Like, I feel like the urban population is very conscientious about climate change. So the western side. Eastern side, not so much. <laughs> I think so, yes. So at what percent rate? You're going to at least, you can't let the Americans beat you here, right? Five percent? That's pretty aggressive. I'm uh, getting some pushback from the room. That's very, very aggressive. A little bit of context. After the first oil crisis in 1973, the European, Northern European, Western European nations and Scandinavia were able to cut their emissions by five, four, four, four and a half percent per year for about a decade or so until oil prices collapsed. Uh, that's about the fastest it's ever happened. Now, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen that fast or faster, but that's a, that was a very big shock to the system. You would need some pretty heavy policies to get that momentum going. So we can try it. Let's do it. That's the great thing about the model. So look at that. That means Europe, under your leadership, is running a clean, essentially zero carbon, prosperous economy by the year 2100, as right now, a world leader. Great. Uh, that took one tenth of a degree off of warming. OK, right here, you can be. Vladimir Putin, representing, <laughs> representing all the other developed nations. So that's Canada, Australia, Japan, uh, Russia. Canada, Russia, and Australia are big fossil fuel exporters. You kind of like the revenue from your natural gas and your oil in Russia. Canadians like their tar sands. Australia likes its coal. And you've got Japan and North, uh, South Korea, sorry, and, um, and, uh, and so forth. Um, so what do you want to do here, President Putin? Um, I think it would be harder, um, probably at least as difficult as the U.S. Um, for okay. in terms of peak year. So 2028. Sure. All righty. Um, are, are you ever willing to decline? Based on what you just told me, um, maybe, but not by much. In starting in what year? 2050. 2050. And not by much, so less than the 2%? Yeah, maybe 1%. One. 1% one per year. OK, so great. So this is the action from all the developed countries. And we've gone from 4.2 to 3.8. That's not nothing, but you'll notice we still cross the 2 degree threshold almost at exactly the same time. OK, so Sam, would you like to be Xi Jinping? You're Hi. China. I love it. So what would you like to do in China? <laughs> You're the biggest emitter in the world. No By a lot? Well, I think I'd want to stay currently in the United States, so I put 2028. Okay. And in fact, China's pledge in Paris was to peak in 2030. Oh, okay. So that's pretty accurate. And now, are you ever willing to decline? Your economy uh, is projected to grow at much higher rates than the West, because your GDP per capita is still far, far lower. I do. 20, maybe 2035. Oh, very ambitious. At what rate? 1%. 1%. Great. 
So there you see China, which that makes quite a lot of difference. We're at 3.5 now. Uh, who would like to be, how about you, sir? You can be Prime Minister Modi of India. Yes. So I don't, I don't like him, so I you don't like him? <laughs> so you have to kind of channel his position. So what is India's position? I think India would try to compete with China. Try to compete with China? So they do. Same as China. Same as China. Okay, we can try it. Uh, so that's 2028 and uh, 2035. And maybe 1.2. Oh, you're going to beat in, uh, China. Okay. Uh, that's far more aggressive than their actual Paris pledge. Far, far more aggressive. We're at 3.3. Um, and now the other developing countries. So this is a very large group, all of Latin America and South America, all of Africa, uh, all of South Asia, ex-India, uh, all the small island states that are likely to go underwater with sea level rise. So you can be President uh, Pinera of Chile. I think it's going to take a while for them to because they're poor, right? Yeah. Okay, and as uh, Angela Merkel pointed out, it's not their fault. It's the rich people's fault, especially the United States. EU takes some responsibility. So, uh, so in what year, if any, sir, would you like to stop the growth of your emissions? 2050. 2050. Great, let's try it. And are you ever willing to drop? Now, most of the population growth, as we grow from the 7.6 billion we have today to 11.2 the UN projects by 2100 and 9.8 by 2050, almost all that growth is in your countries. So, and, and that's where the poorest of the poor are. They're going to try to get the transportation and air conditioning and access to opportunity and all the amenities that we all take for granted here, they don't have. So that all takes energy. So what are you willing to do here? So no change. Great. Okay. So here's where we are. Three degrees with your <laughs> pledges. And you'll notice we, we cross the two degree threshold pretty much the same timing as before. So although this is a safer world, than the business as usual world. The impacts are still going to be, and I think the only responsible word for this, uh, potentially catastrophic. So let's take a look at what some of those impacts are. So first of all, you'll notice that your emissions peak here 2030-ish and then actually fall. But temperature keeps rising. And let's look at some of the other impacts. The carbon dioxide concentration it's still growing. Emissions are falling, but CO2 concentration is still growing. That's a little curious. Anybody have an idea as to why? Yeah? Still emitting, even though the rate of burning is going down. You're still exactly right. Uh, we're still emitting, and the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is um, accumulating into the atmosphere, that's the gray line, your emissions, and the red line is the rate at which the CO2 is being removed from the atmosphere as it's taken up by photosynthesis and dissolves in the ocean. Of course, that carbon never disappears, it eventually comes back, but this is very simple. It's like filling a bathtub where you're constantly pouring water into the tub at about twice the rate that it's draining out. If you did that in your tub at home, what would happen? So although your emissions have peaked and fallen, they are still substantially higher all the way out uh, than the removal, which means CO2 in the atmosphere keeps rising. That's why the temperature keeps rising. And what are some of the impacts? Well, let's look real quickly at ocean acidification. CO2 dissolves in the ocean. That's where about half of it goes out of the atmosphere, makes the water more acidic. That makes it hard for um, sea life that makes carbonate shells to do so, and that threatens the base of the food webs upon which all life, including ours, depends. You've slowed it down, but the ocean is still acidifying. And let's look at sea level rise. And you're looking at one point, almost 1.8 meters there. So that's very, very serious. What would that mean? Well, 
Let's take a look. So 1.8 meters of sea level rise isn't the real issue. The real issue is what happens when there's a Superstorm Sandy that hits Providence on top of that almost two meters of sea level rise. So this is when Irene hit, uh, hit Rhode Island in 2011. Uh, and that's a map of what Providence would look like with two meters of sea level rise plus a four meter storm surge, which is the Sandy storm surge. Uh, and you guys think you're fine sitting up here on the hill. Forget it, forget it, right? The power plant is out, the sewage treatment plant is out, uh, and there, this is devastating. Now, you should be worried about Rhode Island, but it's much more important for you to be worried about the rest of the world. So I'll give you a real quick example. This is Shanghai today. It's a low-lying delta city. Two meters of sea level rise, and much of it is routinely inundated at high tides and uh, is not viable. And then if you add a four-meter storm surge from a typhoon, Haiyan's was four meters. This is going to be more and more frequent. The projection for Rhode Island, by the way, is that uh, the uh, previous 100-year storm will be expected to happen every year here if we don't do something about this problem. And this is Shanghai after a high-on-scale high typhoon. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't really matter if you live in Denver because what you ought to care about here is what happens on the border of India and Pakistan at the Indus Delta where tens of millions of people will be displaced, what happens as the Nile Delta is inundated, what happens as all these other political hotspots are inundated, plus the crop yield declines, plus the drought, the number of re climate refugees will grow dramatically compared to what it is today. So uh, although your scenario is better, it's still quite risky for all of us. Question, go ahead. Yeah. Are these weather scenarios available on the sea roads? Uh, okay. So this is from a publicly available website. There's lots of them. If you email me later, I'll send you all the resources. Yeah. Um, so would you like to go back and revise your pledges? Yes. So what would you like to do, Mr. Trump? <laughs> so let's, um, let's try for uh, 2018. Let's, let's be as aggressive as and let's see what that looks like. So give me a year. 2018. So right now. And to cut your emissions? Let's say um, 2023. 2023? You're going to stick with 2%? Yes. Okay. So uh, that helps. Uh, how about the EU? You're pretty aggressive now. Yeah, I think we're doing our best. Stick with it. Okay. Other developed nations, so that's uh, President Putin. Um, start reductions earlier. Give me a year. Uh, so peak at 2025. Okay. And start reductions at 2035. 2035. And uh, you're going to stick with 1%. You're going to lose a lot of your critical ports. You're going to have refugees streaming across your borders. Uh, Try two and a half. Two and a half percent, okay, quite technically feasible. Down to 2.9, that's great. Now, China, uh, you've basically got your Paris pledge here. Do you wanna peak sooner? I'm gonna try to match the United States. 2018 for peak? Right. Let me, okay. And reductions, 2023, but leave it at 1%. Okay, uh, down to 2.7. Uh, Prime Minister Modi? Uh, 2023. Decline? Uh, 2031. <laughs> Which month? <laughs> 2031. 1.2%, you want to stick with that? You said that would be hard, but let's try. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, the other developing countries, so President Pinera of Chile. Maybe 2040 or something like that. 2040. Yeah. And? 2060. 2060 for a decline, and now at what rate? 0.5%. I'm sorry. 0.5%. 0.5%. Okay. So now we're at 2.6. Sea level hasn't responded much. It did come down a little. 
Uh, sea level is just a really tough nut to crack there. Uh, but let's look at um, uh, temperature. So that's starting to, to be better, right? So I'm going to move on, but this is the idea. And I am not putting in the policies. You decide. You get the immediate feedback on what the consequences are. One thing I have not showed you but is quite important, and I'll take your question, is that you don't have to accept our assumptions. We can show that the model is based on the best available scientific evidence, peer-reviewed literature, IPCC. Uh, the model's fully documented. We can look at how well it views, uh, how well it replicates history. So this is how well the model replicates uh, actually future carbon di dioxide projections for different IPCC scenarios. And we go right down the middle of what the big models do uh, or, uh, or historical behavior. So all of that is there for you if you want, but um, what counts is that you get to decide if you want to try different assumptions. So here, you can change on this panel uh, a variety of important parameters that govern how much the climate is going to change and in what ways in response to forcing by greenhouse gases. Uh, so you could change the sea level rise assumptions. Uh, let me bring that back up here real fast. You could change the, um, well, let's just look at temperature. So, you know, you might say that uh, maybe I don't think the climate is that sensitive to greenhouse gases. So fine, you get to try what you like. And, you know, maybe we get lucky and the warming with your policies is, is even less. On the other hand, if you're willing to try, hey, we got lucky and the Russian roulette we're playing, we clicked the trigger and we didn't blow our head off, you probably ought to consider what happens if with equal probability we are unlucky, maybe like this, and then even with your policies, we're in, we're in very bad shape. So you're, you're free to try any of these assumptions you want, not because they're better than my assumptions. These are the assumptions in the best, based on the best available evidence, but because if you don't get to try that, you get off the bus and you, you, you can dismiss the model, okay? So uh, we could continue in this fashion, uh, but now here's, here's the question. Uh, so does this work? So first of all, there's very, very clear evidence that lectures, traditional presentations about climate change don't work. So one of the members of our team, Professor Juliet Rooney Varga at, at UMass, ran a controlled experiment up at the Cambridge Ridge and Lanton High School, and this is the treatment group. They're getting the classic lecture. You don't really have to hear it, but I ask you, is there any learning going on in this room? And the answer is clearly no. The treatment group, students, they got the role play simulation that you all are going to do tonight. Uh, and so now each group of students represents one of the countries. I facilitated for the whole group because we have limited time. They're going to negotiate live face to face. And here they go. The young man in the hoodie there, he's the United States. So he's President Trump. And they're trying to persuade him, China, India, Europe, trying to persuade him to put more money. So, okay, it goes on. So we have run this all over the world. Here's a session I ran at the Paris Climate Conference. So while the negotiators were using our model. Uh, we ran it for the public. Uh, and uh, this young man here was a, is, at that time, a high school student. Uh, and I had him play the role of President Obama. And he gave a fantastic speech. And here he is leading the global negotiations. <laughs> high school kids. India started asking a lot of money. We, we can see that if we see the globally ambitious plan, we can contribute 50 billion to global founding at the base of the So uh, turns out I've stayed in touch with him. He's now a freshman at Harvard and still active in climate uh, policy. So uh, this role play simulation, the one you're going to experience tonight over there, uh, has been used all around the world now in just less than three years since we announced it at a White House conference um, with over 40,000 people, ranging from middle school kids 
to CEOs to senior policymakers. They have all participated in this. And so now the question, and by the way, you can learn to do this yourself. Take it to your faith community, your library, your town, your, your, uh, your college and, and high school. Uh, it's pretty easy to learn how to do it. Uh, and so now the question is, can we make progress in the real world? And, and I think the answer is yes. Uh, so at the Bonn Climate Conference uh, last November, where we were with our team as usual, uh, the good, one of the pieces of good news was the U.S. Climate Alliance, the We Are Still In Coalition, which is 14 states plus Puerto Rico, um, all pledging to do their share to meet or exceed the Paris commitment that the U.S. made that the President has indicated will withdraw from. Um, business, uh, businesses are stepping up and uh, what they're finding is they can cut their emissions dramatically and boost their profits. And I think you all probably know that the price of wind, the cost of wind power has dramatically fallen with wind capacity exploding around the world. Even uh, the same dynamic for, for solar PV, it's now less since 2015, less than $1 per peak watt, which means it's competitive with, with uh, grid power, traditional grid power in many parts of the world, including many parts of the world where it's now so cheap that it's competitive unsubsidized. And this graph shows just the green line is actual solar installation, and all these other lines are the forecasts of how much solar would be installed that the IEA, the International Agency, Energy Agency, have made. They are consistently far, far too pessimistic. And the reason this is happening is that the costs are coming down, and as the costs come down, there's more uptake, and as there's more uptake, through learning and scale economies and changes in building codes and growing consumer and business awareness, the costs come down even more. So you have a virtuous cycle. Uh, and the latest data indicate that in many parts of the world, this is Colorado, solar plus wind and storage to solve the intermittency problem, to design and build those is cheaper than operating coal plants. So the revolution is underway. And it's even better than that. If you expand the boundary of your analysis even just a little bit more, here's a new study by MIT colleagues indicating that China could meet the commitment that you indicated and cut its greenhouse gas carbon intensity at 4% per year starting now, and it would more than pay for itself just counting the health co-benefits and 94,000 deaths would be avoided between now and 2030, at least. So when you expand the boundary of the mental model you use for analysis, climate change turns out to be a solvable problem, one that actually, in many cases, can put money towards the bottom line of your company, increase the economic welfare of your country, and uh, boost your prosperity. So I think with that, I will wrap it up and uh, just tell you that I think there's a lot of hope. The students at MIT, they call me Dr. Doom. I don't like this. My view is this is something we can do. There's hope. Now, hope is not a prediction. Hope is the stance that what we do can matter. And if we take action, we can solve these problems. But it won't happen unless each and every one of us gets up and gets busy. Thank you very much. And if there's any time left, I'll have to We're at 12.55, so we have a few minutes for questions. I think you had your hand up first? Yeah, I did. Great. I think actually she was up first. Okay. So what, whatever you want to do. Thank you. Right. So, um, so I have not testified in anything relating to Rhode Island. Uh, I have testified before. I've briefed members of Congress and the administration <coughs> most recently on wood bioenergy, uh, just recently in D.C., members of the Senate. Uh, who then went ahead and 
passed the erroneous declaration that wood is climate carbon neutral. But, uh, but I haven't in this case. But I think this is what's essential. And there are lots of folks around who have specific expertise in the issues you're talking about. And you should reach out to them and see if they're willing to speak up in these contexts. Right. And so we're fighting that as well. So thank you. Yep. Great. And uh, this mic, I think, is working better. So hi. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Brichtal. I'm a visitor here from Norway. Um, hi. I am um, a bit curious about your model and then what we could do. So you're talking about how much uh, cuts in emissions we need. Uh, are there also variables in your model on what measures we can use, and yep. particularly in terms of the energy, future energy mix? Yeah, so, uh, so the answer is yes. That's actually a different model, okay. one that we call En-ROADS, the Energy uh, Rapid Overview System. I don't have time to show that to you, but like the model I've shared with you today, freely available, fully documented, and you can try it out yourself. Okay. And that allows you to look at policies like what if we put a meaningful price on carbon? What if we cut the subsidies for fossil fuels? <clears throat> what if we dealt with the fugitive methane emissions, et cetera? Because I guess that would be important in order to motivate um, these nations to actually do the cuts. And in terms of, you know, whether or not underdeveloped or the other uh, developing countries are more or less um, uh, given the right to um, to um, continue polluting is a is a question that goes beyond merely the fact that we have done so much bad in the past. Uh, right. If we can give them the tools they need to, to choo choose otherwise, that's, so that's basically what I completely I'm agree. Okay. You know, if 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 a developed country goes to a, a lesser developed country and says, "Look, it doesn't matter that we," as one kindergarten student said, uh, "Yeah, I get it. You drank your juice, and then you drank our juice." Uh, it doesn't matter if we go and lecture them about how you know common but differentiated responsibilities doesn't cut it, they're just going to sit there like that and say this is more traditional, hegemonic, neo-colonial oppression of our peoples and we won't stand for it. But when they can run the simulations themselves, and this has actually happened in sessions I've run, and they take the emissions of all the rich countries to zero tomorrow, and Shanghai still disappears and the Indus Delta right. still disappears, right. now they're motivated to uh, take the their emission cuts seriously. Nobody told them, they discovered for themselves. And now, common but differentiated responsibilities becomes a matter of those of us who benefited historically and became as rich as we are by burning all that carbon, we have to pay. We have to help them cut their emissions by paying and providing technical assistance. Maybe one more? So yep, time last for question one more. over here. Thanks. Um, had a couple questions. Uh, so one, I noticed there's no error bars uh, or anything like that in your model. So how would you characterize, you know, the uncertainty that's built into it? And are these lines more optimistic, pessimistic, or? So these are the expected values. And uh, of course, in a scientific publication, we're going to do the full Monte Carlo sensitivity analysis. We're going to show you the confidence bars uh, and, and, and the standard errors of our parameter estimates, et cetera. That's what we do when we interact with the scientific community. But I got to tell you, as the late Steve Schneider often joked, you can't talk about those things in a policy or public forum. Uh, you know, if I say, well, you know, let me show you the, the PDF, the, policy, the probability density function for, for these simulations, uh, well, he used to joke and he said, no problem, everybody knows what a PDF is. It's those okay. documents that you can open on anyone's computer. That just doesn't work. So our approach is, I can show you all that, yep. Happy to do it offline. Uh, but instead, you run your own experiments, right? If you think climate sensitivity, sensitivity is lower or higher, you just pull the slider and try what you like, et cetera. And that's the only way we've discovered that people can take on board the, uh, the risk issues associated with what if these numbers are wrong. That, that's great. And just one short <laughs> plug. I, I'm uh, one of the leaders of a group called Climate Action Rhode Island, which is the state affiliate of 350.org, and I wanted to let everyone know if you're interested, we're meeting tonight on the Brown campus at the UEL, 135 Angel Street at 7 o'clock. Great. And you can find me after the meeting. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.